<laughs> okay, so speaking of preparation and preparing for today's message, I ran across some quotes from a preacher named Leonard Ravenhill. I don't know if you guys picture there. He passed away in the 90s. And uh, he was an evangelist and an author. Uh, he focused on the subject of prayer and revival, which we've been talking about a lot. He authored a book on revival called Why Revival Tarries. Uh, he's known for challenging our Western and modern Christianity, be more like that of what we read about in the early church in Acts. Uh, through his teachings and mentorship, he influenced a lot of people, like uh, Keith Green. I know we got some Keith Green fans in here. I know Carol's a Keith Green fan. He influenced Keith Green, uh, Dr. Charles Stanley, and David Wilkerson. He's also a close friend of A.W. Tozer, which you don't hear a lot about, Leonard Ravenhill. Well, let me share a few quotes with you this morning of his. And one has a very particular bearing on what we're studying this morning. Let me just read a few of them to see what kind of guy this was. He wasn't afraid to speak his mind. He said, a man who is intimate with God is not intimidated by man. How can you pull down strongholds of Satan if you don't even have the strength to turn off your TV? He said, the early church was married to poverty, prisons, and persecutions. Today, the church is married to prosperity, personality, and popularity. When there's something in the Bible that churches don't like, they call it legalism. He wrote, one of these days, some simple soul will pick up the book of God, read it, and believe it. And the rest of us will be embarrassed. Are the things you are living for worth Christ dying for? And this quote that he has here now is has to do with our message this morning. He wrote, The greatest miracle that God can do today is to take an unholy man out of an unholy world and make him holy, then put him back into that unholy world and keep him holy in it. So we're going to talk about becoming and staying holy today because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. Let's pray for it begin our reading. Father God, we just, uh, those are strong words. You're asking us to be holy like you are holy, and how do we do it? And Father, we are so thankful, Lord, for the Apostle Peter, Lord, and what he writes, Lord, to tell us how to do it. So, Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord, that speaks to us. And we ask right now you would speak to each and every one of us. So, Father, we thank you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, in 1 Peter chapter 1, Last week, we read about God's abundant mercy, uh, the living hope we have through the resurrection of Jesus, and our eternal inheritance. It is these things that Peter wrote about in verses 3 through 12 that he has in mind when he starts verse 13 with the word, therefore. So we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. Let me read them for you. Peter writes, therefore, again, from all that he just spoke about, we read about last week, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. So let's cut right to the chase here. Be holy, for I am holy. That sounds like a pretty tall order to me. I'm supposed to be holy like God is holy? I can't live up to that. You know, God originally said these words to the children of Israel back in Leviticus chapter 19, and as we know, most of them couldn't cut it. I know, and I'm hopefully all of you know, that God is holy. Amen. Amen. And as I, in Isaiah 6, 3, it says, The angels around the throne of God cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. We say that together. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. They say it three times there, not because some of the angels are hard of hearing, but because when the word holy is said twice in Hebrew, it's to describe a person as most holy. To say the word holy three times intensifies the idea of holiness to the highest level. In other words, God's holiness is indescribable. So again, how can I possibly be holy like God is holy? Holy, as we've been studying, means to be set apart. When the word is applied to God, it means he transcends all of his creation in such a way that, that he is distinct from everything else in existence. 
He is pure and totally separate from sin. When God calls us to be holy as he is holy, it means he is calling us out to be separate from this world and to be separate from sin. But since we are conceived in sin, born into sin as Adam's offspring, how can we ever hope to be as holy as God is holy? Well, it's just like Leonard Ravenhill said, the greatest miracle that God can do today is making an unholy person holy and keeping that person holy in this world. And that's the key. Only God can do this miracle in us. We can't do it by ourselves. But it can be done through the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you as a believer. Without the Holy Spirit in you, you don't have a chance. Now I'm going to throw out three terms to you that some of you may have heard before and some maybe not when it comes to our sanctification or our being made holy. So first there is positional sanctification. That happens when we are saved by Jesus and we are indeed set apart for him. Next comes progressive sanctification, and that is what we're going to discuss today. That's the process of being made holy as we grow in our faith. And then we are only perfectly sanctified when we meet the Lord in all eternity, and we are like him, as it says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, that when he is revealed to us, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The Apostle Paul knew that he could not attain perfection in this lifetime, but he still sought it out. And he knew he would find it in all eternity. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, the Apostle Paul writes, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may hold up, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So this morning we're going to concentrate on that middle one, progressive sanctification, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Now I said earlier that's a tall order. But with the Holy Spirit in you, you can accomplish this in your life. Now, in this lifetime, and in these few verses in 1 Peter chapter 1 we just read, we're told, we're told how to do it. And that's what I love about the Bible. I, I wish Doug was here this morning because he always points out, you know, it's, it's great we talk about we should do this. The Bible says we should do this. How do we do it? 99.9% .9 of the time, the Bible tells us right there, okay, I want you to do this, and this is how you do it. So if we, if we are given precepts or instructions, we aren't just left to our own devices to, to figure out how to carry them out. The Word of God tells us how. And the Spirit of God living inside of us gives us the power to do so. We just have to be willing to do as the words say and as the Spirit leads us, and we need to do the work of it. So let's take a look at how to be holy, as God is holy, as Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, 13 through 16. So in verse 13, the first instruction he gives is to gird up the loins of your mind. You're probably wondering, what does that mean? In the NIV, it's much easier. It says, with minds that are alert. Peter uses the gird up the loins of your mind thing because in Peter's days, men, men wore long robes that had to be tucked into a belt when they had physical work to do. So was, they, would, they would do that to get ready. So you could say today, like, when you say, okay, let's roll up our sleeves and get to work, same type of thing. Or, or let's act like we mean business, same type of thing. The idea is that our mind, our thoughts, would be prepared and ready for a spiritual battle. The point is that holiness begins in your thought life. What you think about determines how you live. So what you think or think about determines how you will live. As believers, we need to deal with ungodly or sinful thoughts at the moment we have them. Confess them to God and replace them with thoughts of God and his word. If you're envious of someone, judge it, confess it, and ask God to replace those envious thoughts with thoughts of his love for that person. If you're lusting after someone, flee from it mentally and then physically. There isn't anyone who ever committed adultery or sexual immorality who didn't first entertain that thought in his or her mind. So we need to guard what comes into our thoughts as carefully as we guard, you know, what we eat. Think about this. You wouldn't look forward to going down to the dumpster at the end of the parking lot and getting some food out of there because it'd probably make you sick. 
been out in the heat all day? If you look forward to and feed your thoughts daily with materialistic things and sensual images, you're going to find it very difficult to become holy as he is holy. And we all deal with those temptations. The Apostle Paul in Romans 7.15 says that he knew the things he should be doing, but he ends up doing those things he knows he shouldn't, and that's the sinful and ungodly things. But again, he also has answers for himself and for us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, Paul instructs us to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And he goes on in verse 6 to write, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. This is a biblical principle that, that the world has a fancy term for now. I think, uh, Dennis, what they call it, cognitive replacement therapy, is that the same thing? Cognitive behavioral therapy. Behavioral therapy. It's been in the Bible for thousands of years. It was right there for us. Replace those thoughts with thoughts of Christ. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, Paul writes, But I discipline my body, and I bring it into subjection. So these aren't easy things to do. And they may seem painful. But we need to remember why we're doing them. And that is to bring us closer to Christ and the gracious salvation we will fully experience when he returns and we are changed into his likeness. So we start the process of becoming holy by guarding our thoughts and our minds. Then Peter reminds us to be sober while we do that. So is he saying, well, don't try to do this when you're drunk. Yeah. You know, Peter uses this word sober several times in his epistles. And yes, it may mean not to be physically drunk, but Peter means that we need to be spiritually alert and self-controlled. Rather than be controlled by outward circumstances, we should be directed from the Holy Spirit within us. We should not be intoxicated, if you want to use that term, by the things of this world. And the last part of verse 13, Peter writes that we should rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So God's grace is the motivation for holy living. That future grace, eternity with him, eternity with Jesus, should motivate us to live holy lives right now, no matter the circumstances we may find ourselves in. You know, and then moving on in these instructions to become holy, in verse 14, Peter starts out by saying, or calling us obedient children. We know that everything Peter is asking us to do requires obedience on our part. We need to get into the habit of asking, what does God's word say about this or that? And then we need to obey it. Then he tells us to do something that many find difficult, and that is to not conform ourselves to the former lusts as we used to be before we became believers. We're actually instructed to do the opposite. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, Paul writes this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I almost think it's easier to do what's in that verse, in Romans, than in 1 Peter. You know, I think we all want to be transformed and have our minds renewed to be in the perfect will of God, but those old lusts get in the way. You know, as you read, even the Apostle Paul struggled with this. There is no other way, and I thought, how do I soften this? But there's no other way to put this than to say we all need to put away those things we used to do as unbelievers that did not bring glory to God or bring us any closer to God. We must make a break with our past lifestyles, whether it was sexual immorality, addictions, coarse language, whatever it was. When we did those things, we were ignorant, as Peter writes. Now... As believers, we should live in response to God's holiness and be transformed and renewed. Saving faith involves repentance and the break with our former lifestyle to seek and follow Jesus and his holiness. So here's the mindset we should have, as it says in Romans chapter 6, verse 11, that we are indeed dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, says that we are new creations in Christ. And the old things, those former lusts, as Peter put it, have passed away and all things have become new. 
Now we know better. And it should come out in our conduct even, as Peter writes in these verses. The change in our behavior begins in our minds, in our thoughts. And then it shows. When our inner thought life is renewed and transformed, then it will change our outward behavior towards others and in our conduct. This sanctification process in us should be apparent in our relationship with others and our sincere desire to love others as he's loved us. Believers should conduct themselves in a notably different way than our old selves and non-believers because of our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You know, the purpose of living a godly and holy life is to glorify God and display his nature to those around us. There is nothing... And I can, I can attest to this because before I was a believer, I felt the same way. There is nothing that turns people off more than to see someone that professes to be a Christian, but his lifestyle doesn't show it. People are looking for something different to prove to them that God really exists and that he cares for them and he wants the best for them and for them to change. But when they see a Christian who acts and behaves and sins just as they do, then they think, why would they want this God in their lives? What's the difference, they think to themselves, between that person and me? But when they see someone living out their faith and growing, then they want to know more about God. And remember, people can spot it when you're faking or calling it in, however you want to put it. Now, there's a story about a, a teenage boy took his driving test, did a perfect job. His only mistake was when he was finished and he sighed a big relief and blurted out to the instructor, boy, I'm glad that's over. I don't have to drive like that again. <laughs> Not the way to do it. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So for us, living a holy life of obedience to God is living in true freedom from the bondage of sin. Romans 6.6 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So what I would like is to all of us to, to leave this place today, or those that are listening in, to know that we can become holy as God is holy. Peter lays out the steps for us. It starts with this. It starts with having a relationship with Jesus and having the Holy Spirit in you because without that foundation, we don't have a chance. So first off is a relationship with Jesus, right, Liam? Yeah. There we go. <laughs> then we need to keep our thoughts in check. We need to protect what goes into our minds. And we need to be alert and aware of the spiritual battle that's going on. We need to be focused on our eternal salvation as promised us by Jesus and not focused on this life alone, but on our eternity, on our eternal life. We need to be obedient to God's word and his instructions. We need to, to, uh, to make that break with our past lifestyles before we came to Christ. And then we need to transform and renew our minds with the things of God. The Word of God promises us, as we do these things, that we can indeed become holy as He is holy, starting in this lifetime, and then revealed in its fullest in all eternity. Now, we can never be as holy as God, since such absolute holiness belongs to Him and Him alone, but we can grow in personal holiness, and by doing so, we will get to know Him better, and we will bring glory to His name. If we're doing these things, living a life set apart for God, separated from our old ways of living, we are following God's command to be holy, for I am holy. And remember, God is not calling us to be perfect in this life, but to be distinct from the world, called out from the world, separated from the world, and we need to live that reality in our day-to-day -day lives as Peter has instructed us. And it's important also to note don't give up if you mess up. When we fail, our biblical response is to confess that sin and move forward on our path to holiness because we will all mess up. 
You know, Romans 8, 1 says this, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. God's grace doesn't go away when we make mistakes, but his grace should motivate us to live those holy lives that he has called us to. Bless you. Let me close by saying this and sharing a quote with you that I ran across. The main idea behind holiness is not moral purity. Anybody can do that. Moral purity should be a byproduct or result of holy living in our lives. The main idea of holiness is that being set apart, as we discussed earlier, so look at it this way, instead of building a fence around his own perfection and telling us to keep out, no trespassing, God calls us to come in, to come inside there and share his holiness with him. That is awesome. Holiness is not so much something we possess as is something that possesses us. So just as that pastor said, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a miracle in the making. You are a miracle in the making. As a believer, God has taken you out of an unholy world, made you holy through the sacrifice of his son Jesus, and now he has placed you back in this world even if for a short time in all eternity, and he will continue to grow you in holiness until the day he returns for you. The Bible promises us, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's get out there and be holy. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Father, for your word, Lord. And I know when we first started looking at this, it's a tall order to be holy as you are holy. But, Father, we see how your word, how Peter just lays it out for us, the things that we are to do. So, Father, we know it's a process. We know we're going to stumble. We know we're going to fall. But we know there's no condemnation in you. Father, we know we have that promise in 1 John 1, 9, just that you will, if we confess, you are faithful to forgive us and make us clean. So, Father, as we go through this path, as we go through this progressive sanctification, as we go through this path to holiness, Father, just... Through your Holy Spirit, Lord, we have the power to do so, but we also have to be willing to do the work, Lord, to put away those things, make a break with the past things, to renew and focus our minds on things of you, to transform our very selves, as you say in your word. So, Father, I ask for each and every one that is a believer in this room or listening today, Lord, that that would be our goal, that every day we would get that much closer to that holiness, Lord. And when we do finally see you in all eternity, see you as you really are, Father, we'll be that much closer here in this lifetime. And Father, for those who just don't know your love for them, don't know what you sacrificed for them, Father, I ask today, Lord, your Holy Spirit would speak to them and tell them that, that I am a holy God and, and I love you, I forgive you, and now come join me. Come in and I will share. I will share my holiness with you. What an awesome promise from our Father. So Father, we do thank you. We do love you. We pray all these things in your precious Son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.